not looking very strong right now after Afghanistan spreading itself out thinly. Uh, you, we see uh, Russia testing them out in, the, um, in, in, in Syria, in the South China Sea, spreading them out thin. I mean, and all this condemnation that's going on now, when you think, and we talked about this just before we started uh, the show, uh, Putin came out just the other day. Dr. Stephen Lieb, over to you. Thanks so much, Shane. And uh, Stephen, it's just a real privilege and uh, to be with you today. And, and I really look forward to spending a little time. We never have enough time for these things, but a little time. And, and really, in particular, maybe because we have gold and silver in our hearts here, maybe we took, you know, revolve a little bit about the gold and silver. But look, look at today. Look what's happening today. We've, we've parachuted you in on a day when we have a major geopolitical uh, event. Can you give us your thoughts on what, what, do, you, what do you see happening today? What, you know, what, what are the drivers? Well, I mean, I think that the, the drivers are, I mean, the major driver, I think, is, I mean, I hate to say this. Uh, I think it's United States policy. And, um, Andrew, when we went off the gold standard, um, in, in the early 70s. Basically, we had all the money in the world, literally, to spend. I mean, it, it took a while for us to spend so much that it's now become a critical issue. But if you look at the uh, Fed balance sheet, $9 trillion is an awfully big number. And, and you know, basically, my, my thing is you can't be free if you have no discipline and no real regard and cohesion in your society. And we've become a society that is basically, we've gone downhill. I don't know how else to put it. I hate to say that. I mean, I really do about America. And one reason I do say it is that I think we could still come back. Uh, but what you're seeing today is, is what are the results? And basically, this is all about scarce commodities. You know, the U.S. is kind of not looking very strong right now after Afghanistan spreading itself out thinly. Uh, you, we see uh, Russia testing them out in, the, um, in, in, in Syria, in the South China Sea, spreading them out thin. I mean, and all this condemnation that's going on now, when you think, and we talked about this just before we started the show, uh, Putin came out just the other day and said, um, well, actually, no one, I haven't ever published this before, but we wanted to join NATO um, and Clinton shut us down. Any thoughts on that? I think we, we're going to have to learn a lesson here, Andrew, and I fear that the United States is going to have to take a big step backwards in order to move forward again. And I think that the catalyst for this will be, again, uh, a gold-backed reserve currency. And it won't be a yuan. The Chinese do not want a yuan. And, and, and I get this from reading a, a paper that was written by uh, a, a, the, the head of the uh, PBOC. Uh, I can't pronounce his name. I'm terrible with language. But he was regarded as one of the the brightest and best in China. He wrote a, a white paper uh, right in 2009 and said the, the business of having a sovereign currency also being a reserve currency is crazy. And he pointed to the SDRs as an example of what could have served, what could have come out of Bretton Woods and what should have come out of Bretton Woods. And if you read very closely, he basically is arguing for a gold back basket of currencies, but he doesn't mention gold by name. But obviously you can't back in a world of, of where you have commodity shortages, which is really what we have today. And I, I can talk a little bit about that too. Dramatic commodity shortages across the board. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, you, you, you can't back a currency uh, with something that's going to run into short supply. What are we going to back the currency with copper? As we see, we run out of <laughs> what, what sense does that make? No, gold is truly unique in the sense that it's prized not for its industrial uses, which 
has some, but all those can be substituted, but it's prized for its beauty. And I'll let the philosophers decide why that's the case. The philosophers and the economists can come together. Is that a platonic uh, issue or is it an issue that we're just used to gold as a currency? Uh, I, I have no idea. I mean, you know, that enters religious, ph philosophical, economic realm. I just know it's true. Gold has been prized for thousands, literally thousands of years for its beauty. Not the fact that as silver, silver too, should be a massive participant because that's going to be scarce supply. We're not going to have uh, widespread solar technologies <laughs> without using silver. I mean, photovoltaics, you can't, you know, they can, uh, what they call it, I forget the exact word, but you can cut down on the amount of silver that you use, but the amount of solar voltaics you're going to need in order to get this world into a position where it can be sustainable, we're going to have a devil of a time doing that because it's just not that much silver combined its monetary value. And if you believe the world is going to continue to grow, silver could actually do better than gold. Although, mm. I don't know. I mean, I... I when I talk about this stuff, I get carried away because there's such frustration when I think about what this country did and, and, and how it gave it all up. Uh, you know, Andrew, all the technologies today that China has, and in many cases has improved on, we created those technologies. They came out of Bell Labs. They came out of AT&T, which was a uh, uh, government controlled monopoly in communications that was broken up. Now, OK, I understand breaking up something that's a threat to competition, but I don't understand not protecting Bell Labs. What we did is we just sort of shoved Bell Labs into the weakest of the uh, companies that we broke up, uh, and that was Lucent. Lucent went bankrupt and Bell Labs became a shadow of itself. Bell Labs that created the internet, created the laser, created uh, I mean, the transistor. Why do I forget about the transistor, which is the basis of everything. Uh, and, you know, for a long time, the, the company, the, the, the chairmen that ran Intel, the bosses of Intel were descendants, I mean, uh, um, work descendants of Shockley. They either worked for somebody who worked for Shockley, he was one of the inventors of the transistor. And then once Gordon Moore, or once, no, not Gordon Moore, once Grove left Intel, uh, the next person in was somebody who had nothing to do. And that's when Intel lost its mojo. I mean, it, it was so, it was as dominant in its day and more dominant than, than, than Taiwan Semiconductor. And, and I'm not talking years ago. I'm talking, you know, probably at the beginning of the century or certainly in the late 1980s, everything was Intel. Nothing was advanced micro devices. It, it was like sort of existed to prevent Intel from becoming a monopoly. That's why today advanced micro devices, technologically speaking, is ahead of Intel. I mean, how does this happen? How do we allow this kind of thing to happen? We allow it because we become obsessed with money and, and, and obsessed with everything that we can do and how strong and powerful we are. And you that leads to complacency, total, utter complacency. And ironically, the values that we share and, and what we're told that we want to protect by Biden in his speech last night, which is freedom and virtue. These are exactly the values that we're losing as a result of this overwhelming complacency that we have in, these in this country right now. We have to get this stuff back. Americans, if left to their own devices, are an extraordinarily creative folks, as, as are the British. I mean, you know, the number of people, I mean, Maxwell, I mean, you know, you can go back and the West, basically founded modern technology. It, and the East basically now has, I, I can't say they've completely taken over, but they sure are on their way uh, to, to, to doing it. And the only way we can get it back 